Let us open God's word at Genesis 24, and we read the verses 1 through to 9. Now, the theme of this afternoon's topical sermon is to do again with taking oaths in the name of the Lord our God. And so that's why we read this passage. We could have read many other passages from God's Word to do with taking oaths in His name, but this one gives us a good entrance into the theme of swearing by the name of the Lord. So, Genesis 24, verse 1. Now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, Please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. Servant said to him, Suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I then take your son back to the land from where you came? Then Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this my oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Amen. Thus far the reading from God's word. I will also read for us from page 127, and you may not be able to read that with me, but I will read for us two short paragraphs from chapter 22 of the Westminster. So 22... Point three and 22.4. Whoever takes an oath ought to consider seriously the great importance of such a solemn act, and in doing so should affirm nothing but he himself is fully convinced is the truth. A person may bind himself by oath only to what is good and just. What he believes to be such and what he is able and resolved to perform. Paragraph 4. The oath is to be taken in the plain and usual sense of the words, without equivocation or mental reservation. It cannot oblige a person to sin, but when it is taken in matters which are not sinful, it obligates performance of the oath, even though it may hurt. The oath is not to be violated, even though it is made to heretics or unbelievers. And thus far, the Westminster. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, taking an oath in God's name, is a weighty matter. Why? Well, because the third commandment says in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy 5, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name 
in vain. So, you and I don't want to take God's name in vain. Not in our marriage vows. Neither in our church membership vows or our profession of faith vows. Nor in our ordination vows as a pastor or as elders or deacons when they come in for a new term. Or the vows we make in a court of law or to the government. For example, at a citizenship ceremony. Well, our sermon has three points again. And to do justice to explaining these points, you and I will have to read more Bible passages at intervals through this sermon. However, don't get worried, because I have made sure that the total word count will not be more than that of my usual sermons of about 2,500 words. The three points are speaking the truth. Speaking the truth even to unbelievers. And the last one is refusing to take an oath, a sin. So firstly then, speaking the truth. My brother and sister, if you and I take an oath in God's name, we must take it in the way Jeremiah 4 verse 2 describes. In truth, in justice, and in righteousness. The Christian should use no ambiguous words in an oath or a contract. No words that can be interpreted in two or more different ways. Look, is that not what the psalmist says? First, he asks a question in Psalm 24, verse 3, also in Psalm 15. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? And then the psalmist answers in verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood? And then he says, And has not sworn deceitfully. See? It is because human society is corrupt and riddled with lies and broken promises that we swear oaths at all. It is because man in general treats oaths lightly that we have to have courts and hosts of lawyers. Even someone in our church studying to become a lawyer. Indeed, especially when it comes to money, few people can be trusted. And so too, do few people feel that they can trust others. Many people have entered sadly, are still entering into oaths in a cavalier manner, in a flippant manner, especially marriage vows in our day and age. But also even in church vows of membership, of ordination and congregational vows, for example, baptismal vows. Sometimes we've seen it. Our parents who have promised that they will raise their children in the fear of the Lord are not doing that. But God's word warns us to make sure you and I know what we let ourselves into. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 5 says, It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay, that you should not fulfill it. Of course, that's not what Jephthah did in Judges 11. He took a vow without thinking of the possible consequences, which meant that he then, to stick to his vow, had to sacrifice his one and only daughter. Well, 
Similarly, you and I might often have experienced how someone has come to us and said, if I tell you something, will you promise not to tell anyone else? But how can we promise not to tell anyone before we have heard that person's secret? I mean, if someone comes and tells me, Hey, Peter, I've decided to kill a person tomorrow afternoon, so please promise you won't tell anyone. Could I then keep quiet? After all, has God not given us the command to protect life? The same if an, if an elder were to say to me, Peter, if I tell you something, promise you will not tell anyone. But what if the elder is going to, to next tell me that he has committed adultery? I will have to tell at least, or to start with, the other elders. And who knows who else will have to hear about that serious sin? So if you and I have to take an oath, Let's make sure that we know what we're in for. Look, is that not what Abraham's servant did? Genesis 24. He swore by oath to Abraham that he would go find a wife for Abraham's son Isaac from Abraham's kinsmen way up north, not from the pagan nations. But in that oath, which he swore to Abraham, this servant had built in a proviso. And that is that if the woman that he finds there is not willing to come with him back to Abraham, then the servant would be absolved from that oath that he took. So Abraham's servant makes sure of the ins and outs of this contract, of this oath. He took the oath responsibly, covering all sides. Well, that's not always what some tradesmen and, and some sportsmen and women do. You see, some tradesmen will promise to take a certain job. Let's say it's a bricklayer. I will go and do that house. Then a bigger job comes up just the day after. And then this bricklayer or this cabinet maker renege on their promise. Some sports people do the same thing. They give their signature to, let's say, a five-year contract. So a kind sponsor has vowed to pay for them X amount for the next five years. But then they see a better financial deal one year later. The next thing, they want to tear up their contract. The Christian should never deceive with oaths or promise by oath that which he or she is not sure to keep. Perhaps someone will now say, but, but pastor, I get it that I'm not to swear deceitfully, but, but what if I'm swearing an oath to an unbeliever, a pagan or, as the Westminster says, to a heretic, a person who preaches false doctrine. Pastor, such person does not believe in my God, in the true God anyway. So is it okay if I swear deceitfully or ambiguously to such a guy? Well, that brings us to point two. Speak the truth even to unbelievers. The Bible teaches in no uncertain terms how God punished his covenant people for lying to unbelievers and even to enemies. Oaths, even oaths to unbelievers are to be kept. So, for example, when the Israelites broke the oath they had made with the Gibeonites. Then we read in Joshua 9, but I will not read it now with us. So just 
asking the following questions. My brother and sister, do you remember how the Canaanites or the pagans of Gibeon, that is a settlement not too far west of Jerusalem, how they were scared stiff that Joshua and the Israelites would kill and annihilate them as they had done with other peoples in Canaan. Remember how they then pretended that they were from a far country. Just remember how they even clothed themselves in worn-out clothes and worn-out sandals, how they deliberately took with them dried-out old bread to convince Joshua and his men that they were from a faraway country and that they had traveled for a long time. Remember how Joshua and the leaders then made that oath in the name of the Lord with them, never ever to kill them. But remember also how when Joshua then found out that these cheaters were from just nearby Gibeon, he kept his oath. And so the Gibeonites, pagans that they were, cheated Joshua and the leaders of Israel into making an oath with them. What did Joshua and what did the, uh, Israel's offspring do with this oath about 100 to 200 years later? Well, in order to see this, Will you please turn with me to 2 Samuel 21, verse 1. We're going to read nine verses. 2 Samuel 21, verse 1. 2 Samuel 21, verse 1. And this is now about 200 years after Joshua made that oath to the Gibeonites. We hear, now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the presence of the Lord. And the Lord said, and he talks about this famine, it is for Saul and his bloody house because he put the Gibeonites to death. And so Saul broke the oath that the Israelites had made. Verse 2. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the sons of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the sons of Israel made a covenant with them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah. Thus David said to the Gibeonites, What should I do for you? And how can I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, We have no concern of silver and gold with Saul or Saul's house. Nor is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And David said, I will do for you whatever you say. So they said to the king, The man who consumed us and who planned to exterminate us from remaining within any border of Israel, let seven men from his sons be given to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, the chosen one of the Lord. And the king and David said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath of the Lord, which was between them, between David and Saul's son, Jonathan. So the king took the two sons of a woman called Rispa, the daughter of Aya. The two sons' names were Armoni and another Mephibosheth, whom she had borne to Saul. And he took the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she had borne to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholatite. 
Then he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the mountain before the Lord, so that the seven of them fell together, and they were put to death in the first days of harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. Thus far the reading. So what do we see? Well, we see that David kept his oath made in Joshua's days with the Gibeonites. He kept this oath even though it hurt. So it did just as Psalm 15 or Psalm 14 verse 4 says. Remember this psalm starts off in verse 1 saying, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell in your holy hill? And then verse 4 says, He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. The NIV says, He who keeps his oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. In our opening song that we sang from Psalm 15 in stanza 2, in Sing to the Lord, the lyrics went like this. From his vow he will not waver, though it bring him sad reward. My brother and sister, two weeks ago I signed a contract with my Indian neighbor, who as far as I know and can see, is not a Christian. And this contract has to do with houses that my Indian neighbor wants to build on his section. And that we, that is myself and the other three units, agree that he can eventually use our driveway and access to his new houses. But after he has widened and tar sealed our driveway, now, if I were to go back on this agreement, what would happen? Well, among other, I would damage the reputation, the name of my God, the only true God, because my neighbor, neighbor of a different faith knows pretty well that I serve Christ. So far regarding point two then, speak the truth to unbelievers. Here is the last point now. Is refusing to take an oath a sin? My brother and sister, the historic text of the Westminster Confession, that is the original text of the Westminster Confession, has a last line to Article 22.3, a line which the versions in our Creed and Confessions booklet do not have. Here is that last line. It says, Yet, is it a sin to refuse an oath touching anything that is good and just being imposed by lawful authority? It's not a question, it's a statement. Yet, it is a sin to refuse an oath, a lawful oath. And that was the original text of the Westminster. Well, about 120 years ago, the American Presbyterians deleted this last line of 22.3. And because our churches, the RC and Z, have received our versions of the Westminster via the Orthodox Presbyterians in the USA, the versions in our booklet don't have that last line on page 127. Not in the left column, nor neither in the right column. But the men of the Westminster Assembly thought it good and biblical to have that last line, that it is a sin to refuse a lawful oath. And they based their reasoning on three Old Testament passages. We're just going to read one short passage. So please turn with me to Nehemiah 5, verse 1. Nehemiah 5, Verse 1, and we will read 
13 verses. Before we read this, just the background. Nehemiah and the Israelites, they are back in Jerusalem. They're rebuilding Jerusalem after the exile. And then there was hardship, especially for newcomers back from Babylonia. And those people, those fellow Jews, were given a hard time by the rich people in Jerusalem, the rich Jews. And so Jeremiah or Nehemiah deals with this. So let us read Nehemiah 5, verse 1 through to 30. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, We have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. We had to borrow money. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Nehemiah then said, When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials of Israel and I told them, You are exacting usury. You are exacting highest interest from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles, referring to exile. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. Jeremiah says, or Nehemiah says, so I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? And my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let the exacting of usury, let this high taxing stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the interest you are charging them the hundredth part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. Oh, we will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say, Nehemiah. Then I summoned the priests, and it's especially the words that are following now that's important. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and the officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, In this way may God shake out his house and possessions, out of his house and possessions, every man who does not keep this promise. So may such a man be shaken out and emptied. See? These wealthy Jews of his time, Nehemiah made them take an oath in God's name. And they obeyed. But here's now the question. Is it a sin to refuse to take an oath when required by lawful authority? And the answer is, it may not be a sin but one thing is clear from Bible passages, and that is that a lawful authority 
can make, can force me to take an oath. In which case the Christian should be honored to take a truthful oath in God's name. Otherwise, if the Christian refuses to take an oath, he might appear to be hiding something. While God in his word has given his people the privilege to take their oaths in his name. Deuteronomy 6 verse 13. Thus, if by a Christian's refusal to take an oath, he appears to be a deceiver, then this perceived deception more than his mere refusal could damage the reputation of his God. But why should a Christian refuse to take an oath in God's name if he or she has nothing to hide? And if he or she is sure that he or she can keep his or her oath asked for by lawful authority? My brother and sister, may you and I always take the name of the Lord our God not in vain, but in reverence and godly fear, so that before believer or unbeliever, we give God the weight and the glory due Him. Christ said, Let what you say be simply yes and no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Amen.